Hello everyone, let me introduce myself. I'm a Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics, Physics and Informatics and it's my true pleasure to welcome all of you here at this annual event. Uh, I think we've got kind of a good tradition of this event. Let me now introduce the Vice Rector of our University, Professor Stepnowski, uh, who will officially open the today's event, today's ceremony. Uh, for me, I would like to wish you just good time in Gdańsk, uh, very fine, nice discussions as usual. And for those of you who didn't see the Triple Town, I wish it was right here. Let's have a good time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, my absolutely great pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, fantastic event held in the Faculty of Physics, Mathematics and Informatics. And let me convey to you the best greetings from rector of our university, Professor Gwizdawa, who unfortunately couldn't greet you personally, but he has other duties. We are just in the very final moments of introducing the, the new law act in uh, our um, uh, uh, higher education system here at the university. So. But I'm, I'm really pleased to represent him and the university in this, in this event. Well, uh, I don't have to uh, convince you what mathematics means to us here at the university. We feel very proud of our institute of mathematics and all the mathematicians who represent uh, highest standing and excellence in science. And this is something where I'm very pleased to always repeat since I am just a simple chemist quite close to uh, <laughs> some of the applications to, 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 to mathematics. By the way, this very faculty back in time was also partly held, uh, hosted by, by chemists. So uh, we just split it in 1991. So um, nevertheless, uh, let me welcome our um, uh, distinguished guest today. I have uh, a little bi biographical note, uh, which I've read with a high interest. Professor Pham Hu Thiep, uh, who is a Vietnamese American mathematician specializing in uh, group theory and light theory. He's currently a uh, Joshua Barry Distinguished Professor of Mathematics at Rutgers University. Uh, uh, before 1999 to 2008, he was uh, uh, at the Department of Mathematics, University of Florida, Gainesville. Uh, 1996-1998, uh, he held position in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Ohio. Well, and then 1994 and 1995, he was also, uh, he had uh, a, a German adventure in uh, University of Duisburg in Essen. Uh, 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 from 88 to 94, he was uh, also a member of uh, uh, Womonosov University of Moscow. <laughs> so very uh, uh, dense career in, 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 in terms of mathematics, but also geographical locations. Um, uh, he, has, he has been honored by several uh, nominations and uh, prizes between others. I have to mention that he received a silver medal at the IMO in London in 1979. He received also, uh, mm, uh, mm, well, his PhD was received in Moscow University of Womonosov in 88. Uh, mm, and he gained a talk it, at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Rio de Janeiro in 2018, which is a very distinguishing uh, invitation. Um, well, he is also a fellow of the American uh, Mathematical Society uh, and uh, Simon's Fellow. Uh, uh, he has, um, he was the fifth ma uh, Vietnamese mathematician invited to speak at the International Congress of Mathematicians followed, following uh, Frederick Pham, Duong Ho Phong, Go Bao Chao, excuse me for my pronunciation, and Yan uh, Wu, uh, where uh, th this is a very great completion of the, the Vietnamese uh, originated school of mathematicians, and we are very, very happy and glad to host you 
today here at the uh, our uh, in our university. Oh, I have to mention, I forgot that uh, Professor Farm is also associate editor of Annals of Mathematics. So uh, we are very grateful <coughs> that you have in, ex uh, accepted our invitation, and we are all excited to hear your talk. Ah. Uh. Right. Um, so uh, it's uh, my great honor and pleasure to be invited to uh, deliver the 21st uh, Andrei Yankovsky Memorial Lecture. Um, so as you know, uh, Andrei Yankovsky worked in algebraic topology, which is uh, a little bit far from my own research uh, interest. So nowadays you can do anything with Google and also with MassiNet. So actually, I um, so I went to the MassiNet and I looked up some of his papers. So probably you recognize this is uh, probably his. Uh, habilitation, right? And I think that it contains some of the very best, very important results that Andrei Jankowski approved. But uh, OK, so uh, so now let's go to, to my research area. Um, so probably you recognize on the left, this is a, a Ferdinand George Frobenius. And on the right is a Richard Dedekind. So they can, uh, those, they can be considered like the, well, fathers or grandfathers of, of representation theory of finite groups. OK, so the, uh, the representation theory of finite groups uh, started with the uh, letter correspondence between uh, Frobenius and uh, Dedekind in 1896. Uh, actually, there were three letters written, from, uh, written by Frobenius to Dedekind on the April 12, 17, and 26 uh, of 1896. Uh, so later on, the foundation of the complex representation theory um, of finite groups was the uh, were developed by Frobenius, Dedekind, Burnside, Schur, Neuther, and other mathematicians. So just for the, um, um, for the non algebraic maybe let me just uh, recall some of the definition. So what do I mean by representation of a group of uh, fin f? So we just consider a hom uh, group homomorphism from your group into the group of all the invertible linear transformation on your v, where v is a vector space <coughs> over f. So we say that the representation is complex representation. If you fin f, it's just a complex fin. And you say that phi is irreducible if 0 and v are the only g invariant subspace of v. Uh, by a character of phi, I mean the map chi. We send any element of the group to the trace of the, uh, of the, of the uh, transformation or of the matrix. So, so this is one of the, the basic ideas of the uh, representation theory of finite group that uh, instead of studying the representation of your group by matrices or by linear transformation, you can just uh, many times you just focus on the, on the character of your representation. Um, right. So now, if you change the fin f from the fin of complex numbers to any fin of a positive characteristic, then you're talking about the model representation theory. Uh, and the uh, foundation of the model representation theory were laid out by, by Richard Brower uh, starting in 1935 and continued by him over the next few decades. Um, OK, so you can ask me, so the representation theory is such a own area of uh, research. So what is left to study? Well, here's one of the main problems in, in the uh, theory. So given a finite group G and a fin F, we like to classify on the Irreduce the representation of G over this fin F. Um, and even though that, well, OK, so I said that the, the theory is so own, but this main problem is still wide open. Uh, like even for some of your favorite groups, or maybe for my favorite groups. So maybe I can, I should tell you, what are my favorite groups? Well, uh, for instance, you can look at the symmetric group uh, of degree n, or uh, well, maybe the uh, Litton brother, the Ontario group, the, the group of the even permutation. Uh, then, but then you also have a family of very important group, which are called the finite group of Lie type. So basically, this is like the uh, finite analog of the Lie group over the fin of uh, complex numbers. But now you rep replace the fin by the fin of finite fin of a kinematic Q. And then you look at the, uh, like the uh, group of um, the general linear group, the um, special linear group, the symplectic group, and so on. And over the finite fin, you also have the, uh, the twisted analog of those groups. And uh, as you do with the complex Lie group, you also have the exception group of type uh, G2, F4, E6, E7, and E8. Why these groups are important? Well, one, one the reason is that uh, according to the classification of finite simple group, 
the above families uh, together with statistic uh, group give you all the finite non abelian Sieben group. Okay, well, so let's look back at our uh, main problem, uh, the problem of classifying the erosion representation of a group over a fin. Let's look at our favorite case. Let's say that uh, you, you look at the uh, group, uh, the symmetric group, and you look at the, uh, the complex representation. Then probably you learn from the, uh, some of the graduate classes, or even like for the undergraduate, you learn that the erosion representation of G are labeled by the partition of N. So given any partition lambda, then you can associate to it the representation or maybe the character chi upper lambda. And of course, you know that there is this uh, hook formula which allows you to, to find what the degree of the representation. And if you give me a, a permutation and a, and a representation, then you have the Fourier character formula, which uh, in Prisman tell you what the value of the character at that particular permutation. So it looks like we know everything about the representation of the symmetric group. Well, here's one question. So let's look at all the representation, all the erosion representation of Sn. So they mean you look at all the partition, and you want to know what the largest degree of the complex representation of your Sn, like a function of n. And even until now, the best possible result is an, um, asymptotic, uh, is an asymptotic result approved by Vesic and Kerop, and at the same time by Logan and Shep in 1977. And <coughs> And just to tell you how different, how difficult problem uh, the problem was, let me tell you that the answer is like well, you, you just look at the some of the obvious guess that you can come up with. You take the uh, the order of the symmetric group, and you you divide by the by the number of partition. And you, you take a square, and that will be almost the, the best uh, the uh, the result. So support so it in another way. If you take a random representation of the symmetric group, then is the chance is it can be very, very close to be the largest possible one. Um, it's even harder to answer the next question, which is like, uh, so if you fix a per permutation, and then you want to compare the, uh, the trace of that element to the degree of the representation, and you want to know what is the asymptotic of this. Uh, and this, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it like uh, uh, in my talk on Sunday. OK, so, but now let me change the fin. So now instead of the fin of complex numbers, let's take the smallest possible fin, which is the fin of two elements. And then you know that the irreducible representation of G are now labeled by the so-called strict partition of N. They mean that you partition, you, you partition N into distinct parts. Um, and let's say that you take some uh, big number, like 1,000. You pick a, a random, well, not, not quite random, but anyway, a strict partition like the one that I wrote on, uh, in the slide. And, uh, and then we ask the question, what's the degree of this representation? And, I may, maybe I should check with my colleague which Gerhard is, but I think that the answer is unknown, right? Nobody knows what is the, the answer to this question. You can do the same thing like for the group of the uh, 1,000 by 1,000 uh, matrices over the field of two elements, and then you ask for the, for the degree of the representation over F3, and still we cannot answer this question. And even like a, a much easier question, so you take the uh, group of n by n matrices over F2, and you ask what is the asymptotic of the largest degree of the complex representation of this group, like a function of n when, it, when you n tend to infinity. And that's a, that question was answered only recently by Michael Larsen, uh, Gunther Mahler, and myself. So I hope that I have uh, um, convinced you that this main problem is uh, quite a, is a very different problem. Uh, OK, so like we do in math, if you can also solve some problem, then let's let make something easier. Maybe let's look at a subset of the problem and maybe you can, maybe you can say something. So now instead of uh, classifying all the representation of your group, I'm going to look at a, some small one. So let me introduce some notation. So given a group G and a fin F of characteristic P, let me denote by D sub P of G the smaller degree of the faithful representation of G uh, over F. And so, now we pick us our simple group G and the fin F, and I would like to determine the, in, the value of this invariant, D sub P of G, and then I would like to classify all the erosion representation of G, but up to the square of this invariant. Well, if you look at this and you say, well, uh, I picked something like a random thing, like a, like a square of the smallest degree, but it turns out that uh, this 
problem is, first of all, it's not easy. Secondly, it's important. And thirdly, it's very important for, for many applications. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to talk about it in the second half of my talk. So remember that our problem is to, to describe all the illusion representation of your group. Now, let, uh, OK, so if you cannot do it, then at least can you find like, uh, some good way to label the representation? And uh, this is our great colleague um, from Chicago, uh, Jonathan Anperin. And the idea that, that he has is the following. Um, so maybe let me open everything here. So, uh, so you remember that in the Lee theory, if you want to classify the, the Russian irreducible uh, representation of a reductive analytic group, then what you do is you look at the high weight. Right? So the idea that the John Amperin has is the following, that maybe you can try to define something that, that can serve like weight for the moral representation of, of any finite group. So uh, given a group G and a, a prime P, a P weight of G is just a pair Q comma delta, where Q is a P sub of G, that means that the order is just some power P. And then, OK, so delta is a, is a character of the, normal, of the quotient of the normalizer of Q, mod Q, where the, the P part of the degree is, OK, so the P part of the, of the, of the order of the normalizer. So it's something like a P defect 0. Uh, mm -hmm. But the important thing is, like, so here's the conjecture of Anperin. It says that um, the number of the, of the irrational representation of G over the color of P should be equal to the number of the P weight mod, uh, modulo the conjugacy. So, so the uh, representation of G over the field of characteristic P can be labeled by the P weight, like we do in the Lee theory. Um, so this is the Amperian weight conjecture, or AWC. Um, so in fact, this conjecture is just one of the uh, several uh, the so-called global local conjectures in the model reputation theory of finite groups. And I can tell you that all of them um, are seen open until now. What is the idea? The main idea over this, uh, I mean, behind this conjecture is the following, that the uh, if you have a group G, then certain global invariant of the group can be computed locally. So locally means that we can do it uh, using the zero P subgroup, the normalizer of the zero P subgroup, and and so on. Uh, and um, so these conjectures include the the Amperin weight conjecture, the Marker conjecture, Brau high zero conjecture, date conjectures, and some other one. Um, so maybe among the the global local conjectures, the easiest one not to prove but to formulate is a conjecture due to John Mackay. And you know that John Mackay is famous for, for his uh, vision, like to, uh, uh, he can see like uh, some hidden pattern, some, some hidden uh, conjectures, and uh, some of them like, uh, like are, are very important and very deep, like the moonshine, um, uh, the, uh, moonshine conjecture and so on. But uh, here I'm talking about the following conjecture that John Mackay raised in 1971. So he said that if I will find a group G, a prime P, so let P, let the, uh, the, the, uh, the captain P denote the zero P subgroup G, then, then there should be a bijection between the, the complex representation, mm. oh, somehow it's, uh, the complex representation of G of degree per program to P, and the complex representation of G, but uh, of degree, of, of the normalizer P. Or you can say, well, this is, some, uh, this is just a, a pair of finite objects. So this is just to say that there are, I mean, these two, these two numbers are the same, right? Uh, um, so later on, uh, there have been uh, like seven important refinements of this conjecture of, uh, of John Mackay, uh, due to John Amperin, Marty Eidex, Gabriel Navarro, uh, Alexander Turun. Uh, so so they say that, uh, well, not only that you can find such a bijection pi, but you should be able to find such a pi which is compatible with the, uh, the distribution of the representation of G into P blocks with, uh, this, with the action of certain Galois automorphism, uh, with taking congruency modulo P, uh, and, um, or maybe taking the local sure indices, and so on. OK, <coughs> um, so let me give you one example. Let's look at the A5. This is the group of the even permutation of degree 5, and here's the character table of, your, uh, of A5. So you see that uh, we have uh, five rows. It means that there are five characters of degree 1, 3, 3, 4, and 5. Yeah, I think I can do it on, on the screen here. OK. But, um, now, if you take the, 
the prime p to be 5, then the zero p subgroup is about a 5, right? And the normalizer has sort of 10, and here's the group. So it's uh, the dihedral group of the 10. And now the, this group has four characters of degree 1, 1, 2, 2. Now remember that you want to count the ones that are co-prime to 5. So here we have four characters, 1, 1, 2, 2. And if we go back to the previous group, then you have 1, 3, 3, 4. We have four, right? OK. And in fact, so now you can, you can be in your uh, bijections sending 1, 4, 3, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2. And you see that that bijection is compatible, it's commuting with the action of some gal automorphism, and also it's preserving the, the, the current modulo 5 up to, up to sign. Well, that's a, that's a very big piece of, in, of uh, evidence, right? Well, OK. Um, so in fact, those conjectures that I formulate, they have been checked to be true for, for many, many finite groups, including, including the most of the one that you have in, in the atlas, in the big red atlas, in the uh, computer program gap, and so on. So if we've got physics, well, OK. Uh, then maybe, well, we, uh, we can declare that, um, that uh, the, uh, we have some theorem, uh, but not quite. Um, uh, well, uh, we cannot do that because uh, none of these uh, conjectures has been proved to be true for, for all finite groups. So what do you do? Um, so there are seven approaches to these conjectures, uh, but um, after like, um, like um, a lot of uh, unsuccessful attempts to prove them, then we thought that, OK, maybe we can, we can turn to the, uh, to, the, to the most powerful weapon that we have uh, in our hand, which is the, uh, the classification of five simple groups. Uh, so as you know, this is one, probably one of the most monumental theorem in the modern mathematics. The proof of it uh, spread over like uh, 10 to 15 uh, pages, 10 to 15, 1,000 of drawn pages of uh, f about 500 uh, uh, papers. Uh, it was announced to be compl completed in uh, 1981 by my great uh, colleague, late colleague, uh, Dan Gorenstein from Rutgers. Um, but it was actually completed only in 2004. Uh, so, so where does this idea come from? So you know, like you want to, to prove something for all the finite groups. And you learn that uh, every finite group, it been up from seven pieces, which are the seven group. So, so we thought, OK, so if you, if you can use the seven group to, to be up any finite group, then maybe what you can do is you try to reduce your conjecture to some statement about the simple group. And then maybe then, then, then we put it together. You get, we get it for any finite groups. In fact, this is not a new idea. This is already uh, the one that uh, was used in, the, uh, in, some, in, a, in, a, uh, in a sequence of very important papers of uh, every date in the 90s. Uh, but here's a caution. So if you want to follow this approach, then you have to pay like a very hefty price. Uh, so if you want to prove, let's say, the Markite conjecture, then you can have a reduction. But then for the simple group, you have to prove like much more about the, the simple group, not just the Markite conjecture. So, so let, me, let me show you the reduction theorem that, uh, that uh, Marty Isaacs, Gunther Mahler, and Gabriel Navarro proved in, uh, in 2007, published in Invenciones. Um, so they, they say the following. So suppose that you can prove that every finite Lambian Siemens group S is uh, something they call uh, Makai good for the for fixed prime P. Then the Makai conjecture is true for all the finite group and for the fixed prime P. Now the question is, what is Mac, what, what is Makai goodness? Well, I should disappoint you that the Makai goodness is actually like a few pages of their paper listing, giving you like a very long list of complicated conditions on the group, subgroup, and cohomology, and so on. Um, uh, and OK, you can say, well, is this the right way to do it? Uh, we don't know. Maybe in the future, maybe somebody will come up with a very nice conception proof of the Makai conjecture without appealing to the classical of finite Siemens group. But, but right now, this is what we can do. And we believe this is the right way to do it. And we, and we can probably say that here's a highlight of our approach, of this approach. So uh, it was proved by Gunther Mahler and Britta Spett in 2016 that the Makai conjecture is true for the P equal to 2. And this is like a very important uh, um, result, very, 
like um, it's a it's a, a wonderful uh, achievement. But it's in open for only the odd prime. Uh, right. So so I formulated the uh, Ambrin weight conjecture. So let me give you the reduction theorem for the Ambrin weight conjecture. Uh, it was proved by Gaben Navarro and myself. So we also say the same thing. Well, suppose that you can prove that every finite non abelian symbol group is uh, AWC good for the fixed prime P, then the conjecture is true for all the finite groups for the prime P. And again, the, uh, I should say that the, uh, the AWC goodness for the prime P is, is still like a long list of, com of conditions, not just the uh, original AWC. And I should say that uh, a different reduction of this conjecture to symbol group was proved by Louis Puch using the notion of the uh, uh, of the um, uh, Furan system. Okay, so so basically we say that if you can prove this uh, AWC goodness for all the simple group, then you are done. Now we have the list of simple group, so let's go over them and let's check uh, for which one of them we can say that uh, they are actually good. Well, we have three families, right? The uh, small simple group, the ontarian group, and the group of lead type, and for the group of lead type is the same characteristic, then uh, it's, uh, the Gabriel Navarro and I verified that they are all good. Gunther Mahler verified for the ontarian group, and uh, Zhang Bayan and uh, Heiko Dietrich uh, uh, proved it for the Swarik group. Well, so I listed all the f three families, right? So are you done? Uh, unfortunately, we are not done, because like you see that uh, we still have to, to check it for all the group of lead type in the characteristic different from P. So, and this is, like for instance, you, could, you can look at the project of special linear group over FQ, where P with P equal prime to Q. Um, and I just uh, want to briefly mention that, uh, that uh, other reduction theorem also uh, were obtained for other Grove and Logan conjectures. Uh, seven of them are due to Brita Spett from Wuppertal. And then for the brown high conjecture, then uh, the reduction were proved by the combined work of uh, Berger, Knorr, Gabin Navarro, uh, Brita Spett, and Navarro and myself. Okay, now uh, let, let me also mention some recent results on the second problem, which is about classifying the low dimension representation uh, of Siemen group. Um, so there has been a lot of activity uh, on this uh, problem, and many uh, results are proved for various uh, groups. So I try to list some of my uh, uh, colleagues um, in the alphabetical order, so like some of them are in the audience. So we have uh, Bob Granick, Frank Himstead, Gerhard Hiss, um, Cornelio Hoffman, Gordon James, Sasha Kleshev, Martin Liebeck, Frank Liebeck, Kai, Kai Magat, Gunther Mahler, myself, Alex Zaleski. And um, so this result uh, are proved using the many deep uh, results in the reputation theory, the dealing lucid theory, some of the fundamental results of Bruin Michel, Bruin Ferru Kia, branching laws, and so on. And I should say that all, like most of these results um, wouldn't be possible without the fundamental work of uh, George Lustig. Right, so let me try to formulate some of the results on this uh, problem on the low dimension representation. So um, let's say that you look at the symmetric group, then you know that. Uh, that, uh, that an illusion representation of Sn over a fin of classic P is labeled by some partition lambda of N, which is a P restricted in some sense. So when you have this uh, partition lambda, then let me denote by M sub P lambda the longest part of lambda and some technical notion, the Molino du dual of, of lambda. Then uh, a theorem of uh, Bob Granick, Michael Lassen, and myself say that the dimension of such a model is, uh, is bounded by this explicit bound. And, okay, so this is a totally explicit, but on the other hand, it's not of the right mag uh, magnitude. Uh, so on the other hand, very recently, uh, jointly with uh, Sasha Kleshev and Lucia Marotti, we show that uh, we have like another bound, which is now of the right magnitude. You can see this is basically like, a, like the binomial coefficient n to m. So it's a much, uh, uh, it's much better and uh, lower bound. And using these two low bounds, then you can see that you can solve the problem of classifying the low dimension, uh, low dimension representation for the symmetric group. You can go for to any, not just a square, the smallest degree, but you can to you can go to any power of that degree, and you can do it if you even need to. Um, let me also mention 
uh, another result concerning the, um, the special linear group. And this is the theorem that Bob Grandic and myself and, and I proved. So if we look at the uh, special linear group over the field of Q element, and you ask for the B model representation of this group, then the smaller degree is going to be this uh, Q2n minus 1 over Q minus 1, minus 1 or 2, depending on whether your P does divide or divide this uh, quantity. And not only that you know that what is the smaller uh, representation, but you know that there's only one of them. And so there's one, only one of them of that degree. And then you have like P prime part, the Q minus 1 minus 1 of the next degree. And all the next one, they are going to have degree at least a square of the smallest, uh, of the smallest degree. So, so this is a solution for the special linear group. Then Gerhard Hiss and Gunther Mahler solved the problem for the uh, special unitary group. And, th and there are some further results that uh, probably I, sh I shouldn't describe it here because it's, uh, uh, they are more technical. Uh, and OK. And let me also mention the problem about bounding character values. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning that for this symmetric group, we, we would like to compare the the uh, the choice of, a, of any uh, the choice of the I mean the, the, the value of the character any element to the degree. So maybe you can look at this this fraction which is at most one, and then you try to bound it bound it, it away from one, or or you can also try to do it in a much better way. Namely, you, uh, you want to bound it like a function of like a exponential function of chi of one, where the exponent should be something between zero and one. And uh, but I'm not going to say anything more about this because this is a subject of the, my uh, talk on Sunday. And I just want to say that the the result on this problem uh, they are going to be important for a number of applications. Um, right. So so let let's talk about applications. Some of the applications. So the previous result that I described they have been used in uh, various applications in group theory, for instance, for the in some part of the revision of the proof of the classification. Uh, for instance, in the classification of quadratic model, of 2F model. Also, they are used in the computation group theory in the recognition of the uh, group of matrices of permutation of, of some not too big degree. So today, I'd like to, uh, to discuss some of the re uh, recent application in group theory, number theory, and analytic geometry. OK, so the, this is uh, I, I took from Google. So this is about the uh, the, uh, the proof of Andrew Wine of the Fermat Lath theorem in 1995. Um, so there's a long story behind this proof, but uh, what I want to mention is that uh, one of the key ingredients of Andrew Wine proof of the Fermat Lath theorem uh, is a theorem uh, called the modularity, uh, modularity lifting theorem proved by Andrew Wine and Richard Taylor in 1995. So I give the formulation, but basically I just want to tell you that. Uh, the theorem allows you to leave the modularity of the reduction of the Galois representation to the Galois representation by itself. And in this uh, theorem, there is a condition that uh, there is condition that some that the uh, some sub some subgroup has to be big, and where the big where the bigness it just means irreducible. So, uh, okay, um, and then some years later in 2010. Michael Harris, uh, uh, Nick Shepherd Baron, and Richard Taylor proved like a like a very crucial case of the Sato Tate conjecture, and this time they also used some lifting theorem. But this time the lifting theorem leaves the automorphy of some Galois representation, and the uh, degree is now it's not two but n. And again, they have some condition on some subgroup, and the subgroup has to be big. And here the bigness just means uh, irreducible and plus uh, s seven more conditions. Um, in 2012, Jack Thorne, who is now in Cambridge, he further generalized the, uh, the uh, lifting theorem of, uh, of Close and Harris and Taylor, and, but then he replaces the bigness by adequacy. So, uh, OK, so let me tell you what do I mean by adequate, by being adequate. So suppose that you have a fin app of classic P, uh, a vector space v over f, then a subgroup g of g and v is going to be called adequate if you have like uh, the following condition. 
So the G has to be irreducible. Then the H1 of G with the coefficient in F is, is vanishing. H1 of G with the coefficient in N of V mode, the scalar transformation is also vanishing. And then the space N of V, so N of V is V tensor with V dual, is spanned by the P prime element H in G. So under all the condition, you have to say that G is, G is adequate. Uh, and, and the adequacy is needed for several leading theorem that are used in number theory. So of course the question is, uh, can it prove that all, or maybe all, uh, like um, most of the finite erosion subgroup of S, G, and F are adequate? If you can do that, then you see that instead of assume, having to assume that some subgroup is adequate, you can just assume that the subgroup is illusion, like the way that uh, Richard Taylor and Andrew Wine did in their leading theorem. Um, well, so the first result uh, about adequacy actually is can be given to the guard student. Uh, is to show that if your p is co prime to the order of the group, then, then any Euler subgroup is actually adequate. This is just the, uh, at the Atin Guedeban uh, theorem. On the other hand, the next result is already highly non trivial, which, which was proved by uh, Bob Grandick, uh, Florent Hersick, Richard Taylor, and Jack Thorne in 2012. So they proved that if, the, if p is large enough, namely is at least 2n plus 2, then, then, the, this, the trap, uh, in, in, then g is adequate. And this adequacy uh, was already used in some of the uh, new leading theorem in number theory. Um, so uh, Bob Grandick and Florent Hersick and I try to generalize this reason further. And here's the theorem that we have. So suppose that you have a finite even subgroup and let G plus denote the subgroup G generated by all the P element in G. Of course, this is a number theoretic uh, notation. We we'll say O upper P prime of G, but, it, but never mind. So suppose that the, the G plus modern V has a similar submodular dimension less than P, then aside from a few explicit examples, G is adequate. And, and again, the, uh, the, this adequacy result has been used to prove some of the uh, leading theorem. OK, so now let me de describe another application which is in, in geometry. Um, so this is concerned with the alpha invariant defined by Gang Tian. So uh, let's consider a Keller manifold X and a compact subgroup of automorphism of X. Then in 1987, uh, Gang Tian defined an invariant that he called an alpha invariant. And he used the uh, alpha invariant to prove the existence of some uh, G invariant Keller Einstein metric on X in some uh, cases. Now, the case that uh, that we are interested in is the following. So suppose that you have a finite subgroup G acting on an n dimension vector space over C, then the group acts on the projective space. And that would be an example of a Keller manifold. And then in this case, the alpha invariant of Tian is also known to the ger uh, algebraic geometers as the uh, so-called log canonical threshold. OK. Then, OK, so you want to say something about the alpha invariant of the projective space? Uh, then entered uh, John Thompson. Uh, so this is a picture of him in, in Gainesville. Um, so remember that, that Gang Chan defined the alpha invariant in 1987. And in 1981, John Thompson proved that the, the alpha invariant of the projective space is bounded by 4 times n. Uh, of course, you can ask me why, how, how could it be, how could it happen that, that Thompson proved something about something that didn't exist? Well, the, the, there's actually an, a connection between this result of John Thompson, which was actually, actually about something else with the, uh, and the, uh, the alpha invariant. So, so the connection is via the semi-invariant. Um, so we say that uh, finite group G acting on the vector space V has some semi-invariant degree K if this K symmetric power of V contains a one dimension G submodule. And then let, defi uh, let denote by D of G the smallest degree of the semi-invariant of G on, on the space V. Then the connection which was, um, uh, which was um, found uh, or discovered by, by Vanya Chensov and Kosia Shramov say that actually the alpha invariant is bounded by this, the ratio between the degree D of G more the dimension of V. And in fact, John Thompson proved that the he proved that D of G is bounded by four times the square of the dimension. And therefore, as a consequence, he, uh, we obtain that the alpha invariant is bounded by four times N. 
But in the same paper, Rotonson said that, uh, well, this bound is, is very much inflated. So he said that instead of the uh, quadratic bound, we should have some linear bound. So he conjectured in 1981 that there should uh, exist a constant C such that the alpha invariant is bounded by C and the degree of sigma invariant is, is bounded by C times N for all the N, for all the finite subgroup G of GLN, C. Okay, so about um, almost 40 years later, uh, so, uh, so I was able to prove that the Thomson conjecture home we see like uh, uh, this number, uh, which is about like, uh, well, okay, one million and a little bit more <coughs> and some change. And uh, as a consequence, we can also prove something like uh, we can show that any finite subgroup G of any finite linear group has, has some invariant of degree at most C times the degree of the representation times the order of the G mod G prime where C is this uh, humongous constant. So how do we prove this uh, kind of result? Well, we rely on the, uh, on the bound on the character values. We relied on the uh, Aschbacher theorem on the maximum subgroup of Kalashnikov group. And here's a picture of Michael Aschbacher. And we relied on the classification of the low dimensional representation. And of course, we rely on the, on the um, uh, classification of finite Stephen group. OK, um, so let me, let me also uh, uh, spend some time on another application. Uh, so this is, connect, uh, this is related to the, to the wearing problem in number theory. Uh, so, so the problem is the following. So if you fix a K, then you try to write every natural number like, uh, like a sum of the K powers. Of course, we know the uh, theorem due to Lagrange which say that every positive integer is a sum of at most four squares. Uh, and then it was proved by Wifrich and Kamner that every integer is a probably integer is a sum of at most nine cube. So for the squares you need four, for the cube you need uh, nine, for the, f uh, right, okay, one. And for the first power you need only one, right? So for, the, for k equal to one you need one, for k equal to two you need four, for k equal to three you need nine, right? There is an obvious pattern, right? Okay, and then it was actually proved by David Hinbert in 1909 that, that you can do it for any k. So for any k, then you, there is some smallest and implicit g of k, such that every positive integer is the sum of at most g k k powers. So what do you think? What is the g of k? It's not what, 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 what do you think? It's not, the, it's not the k square, but anyway, so. Uh, uh, but then, uh, so the, the problem that you want to look at is, you want to look at some kind of non-commutative version of this wearing problem. So we replace the, uh, the integers by something which is, which is uh, highly non-commutative. We replace it by the finite Simon group. So in, uh, in the 90s, uh, um, Efim Zemanov, uh, Mart uh, Martinez, and also Jan Saxon and John Wilson look at the following problem. And they prove that the, if you have any finite Simon group, then you can write every element in, the, in this group like a product of k powers. And, and they have, uh, so, and you, go, you can do it using some f of k, but f k is implicit. Uh, so what's the motivation for this problem? Uh, the motivation is, uh, aside from the fact that it's related to the, um, to the classical wearing problem in number theory, another like modic, motivation come from the, from the conjecture of, uh, of Serre, which say that every subgroup of finite index in a, in a finite degenerated uh, pro finite group is, is open. And uh, using reason on this uh, uh, wearing problem, uh, so Nikolov and, and Serre proved the Serre conjecture in 2007. So, so here we tried, we, we have a finite group, and then you can, you try to write every element like a product of, of powers. But you can also do it in a more general fashion. Um, so now you can look at the word map on the, on, on the simple group. So what do we mean by that? So we are given with, uh, with W, what's W? W is an element in the free group generated by X1, X2, and XD. We pick any element W, which is not the identity. And if you have a simple group G, then you can look at the, uh, the word map, which go from G upper D to G, and you just uh, substitute every XI 
by any element in your group. And then you want to look at the image of the word map, so which I denoted by W of G. So, so the non-commutative weighing problem is the following. So if you are given with such a word map and a simple group G, then you ask how large is the, is the image? Could it be that, uh, that uh, is, uh, the, the map is just the entire G? So it could be the word map is selective. And if the, word, if the image is non-trivial, then what is the width of the, of the W? So by the width, I mean that the, num the, uh, the smallest k such that when you, when you take the k power of the, of the image, then you get the entire G. So every element in your group is a product of k images. And, and if we assume that the, the, the W of G is equal to G, if the word map is serrative, then you want to know, so, okay, so uh, you want uh, to know how the images are distributed. So they mean that you can look at the induced distribution of the word map, and you want to compare the distribution <coughs> induced by W to the uniform distribution. You want to compare to the to, your, to this uniform distribution in n1 distance, np distance, or n infinite distances. Um, so you, 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 you have to be able to say that maybe the world map is going to be inducing something which is almost uniform. Um, so let me give you some example. For instance, if you look at the W of actual, which is a to the k, then you just get the, the, uh, the wearing problem for powers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let let take the uh, the word to be x y x inverse y inverse the commutator, uh, and then and then the only conjecture is just to say that the the word map induced by the commutator map is just uh, having the width equal to one, uh, or put it in another way, it means that every element in any finite non ben Simon group is a commutator. So, in fact, I'm sorry. In fact, if you look at the, the definition of the, of the width, then I, in fact, it is only like a highly non-trivial result of uh, Martin Liebig and HLF to show that the width is actually when defined. So the width actually exists. Um, then in 2009, HLF proved another important result that actually the width is at most three if your group is uh, sufficiently large. So if you take the cube of the, the, cube of the, of the image, then you get the entire group if you assume the group is big enough. Well, so the question is, uh, can you go down from three to something smaller like two or even to one? And, and in fact, this is the case for the uh, commutator uh, map. So it was proved by uh, Martin Liebeck, uh, Eamon O'Brien, and Anna Shalab, and myself in 2010 that the already conjecture is true. It means that in every finite non simple group, every element is a commutator. But and, and, and also, if you think about it, then you see that uh, if you take your word to be any primitive word, then actually the, the map is also selective, and the width is, so, is only one. But this is highly uh, restrictive, because you can come up with a, a quick counterexample right away that if you look at the x square, then, then this is an ex exercise for the, uh, for the undergraduate that the x square map is not selective on any group of even order. So you cannot say that the width is two, uh, I mean, one, so, okay, so shall I prove that the width is at most three, and we think that it's not one, then would two be enough? Uh, and yeah, so after some, uh, some, some years of, of working on this, then in 2011, Michael Larsen, Anna Shalep, and myself proved that two is enough, namely it proved that if your W is a product of two disjoint words, W1 and W2, and if your G is a simple group, which is large enough, then W is indeed selective. So therefore, if you take W2 to be W1, then you see the width of W1 is going to be at most 2. And OK, so now, now that you know that the map is selective, then you want to compare the distribution to the almost uniform distribution. And in fact, we can also prove it, like um, last year, that when the order of G tend to infinity, then then the, uh, the distribution induced, induces by the uh, word map is almost uniform in the n1 distance. So that means that the n1 distance between the, 
the distribution induced by W, then the uniform distribution tend to zero when the order of the group tree tend to infinity. Um, Right. OK, but the problem with this kind of result is like all of them, they are asymptotic. So we keep saying, if the group is big enough, then everything is OK. But how far you have to go? What does it mean that it's big enough? Uh, so for instance, if you give me some power, can you say that the, power, the word map is going to be selected? Um, so we can prove some of the results which are more definitive. So here's a the theorem that uh, Ma Bob Grandic, Martin Liebig, Eamon O'Brien, and Arne Schalep and myself proved in 2018. Oh, well, it, 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 it appeared in 2018. It says that if you take P and Q to be prime and N to be the product of these two powers, then every element in any finite non even Stephen group is a product of two N powers. Uh, so you see that you have this uh, P to the Q to B, right? And this is a thing that it, it very much remind remind you of the Bernstein P to A Q to B theorem, which say that every group or the P to A Q to B is, is summable. So this result is like some kind of extension of the, of the Bernstein theorem. And using this theorem, you can, you can prove the Bernstein theorem. But of course, it's in a very, very wrong way. OK. Um, and there's also another theorem, which is due to Feit and Thompson, which say that every, every group of odd order is summable. So then you can also prove that uh, as an extension of the Feynman theorem, you can prove that if you n is any odd integer, then the word map sending x, y, z to x to z, y to z, z to z is selective on own finite Simon group, or in fact on own finite quasi Simon group. So you mean that if you give me any uh, finite quasi Simon group, then every element is a product of three n powers. Now we have example to show that uh, two is not enough. So three is the best possible one. OK. Um, so let me also ma mention another result, which is proved just like uh, a few months ago. And now it's about the, uh, the n infinity distance. Uh, so now the theorem is the following. Uh, so if you pick w to be w1, w2, wn, and suppose that all of them are disjoint, and each of the wi has length at most l. So now if you take n, the big n, to be something larger than this 2 to the 10 to the 18 time length to the fourth power, then, then indeed the, the, uh, the, the distribution induced by w is converging to the uniform distribution, but in an infinity distance. So this is a much stronger result than the n1 uh, result. But but the, we have to pay for, for the fact that we use the n infinity um, distance that uh, now we, I have to take the w to be like product of, of a huge number of the of disjoint words. And, and one of the motivation that we prove this reason is because that once you know that, that the, uh, the, n, the, uh, the n infinity distance tend to zero, then we, we get that the, the word map w is going to be flat on any seven algebraic group tree over any field. Um, so, so the uh, so the, uh, no, uh, the notion of the flatness is important in in um, yeah um, in algebraic geometry. And uh, I'm not going to formulate it, but here, but it. So the thing that we use is the following: that we use something that uh, is called uh, uh, miracle flatness in EGA. So we say that you have some morphism where the where the where the fibers they have own the all the fibers have, this, have the right dimension, then the map is actually flat. So this is why we, uh, and this is, and then we prove this result about the n infinity uh, distance. OK, um, so I'm so, OK, so how do you, how do you prove the uh, re result about the, the, uh, the wearing problem? So the starting point for us is the, is the uh, theorem of uh, Armand Borel in 1984, which show that the, uh, the word map on any simple algebraic group is dominant. Uh, they are dominant. And the second ingredient is uh, our theorem about the um, uh, uh, Chebotrap density for word map. So we show that if I have a simple and simply connected algebraic group G and a word map W, then the, if you have a maximum torus, 
then the uh, the image of the uh, of the world map is going to be hitting the the the, uh, the the torus over the final fin the expected number of time. Um, and then we use the daily inclusive theory and we use the character bound that uh, that that I mentioned. And but I, I haven't formulated any result on the character bound, but I hope to to say more about it on Sunday. And Thank you. So I, I skipped like a few, uh, I mean, last night I decided to skip some, a few slides. And so I, I think I finished like maybe a few minutes earlier. But thank you very much.